Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to be here again uh, this morning. Today sees our last in our little mini-series of Hills in the Bible. And today, as you can see from the overhead, we are going to be climbing the greatest of all hills ever climbed. There will be no hill greater to be climbed. Or they can climb Mount Everest and get to the top of it. But this is the biggie. This is the one that really matters. This is where it counts. Today, we're going to be looking at Golgotha. We come to Golgotha, and it's, it's Passover time for the Jews, and it would become Holy Week for Christians. Jesus has been arrested and, is now, and now stands before Pilate, accused by the Jewish leaders as a rebel and subversive. I'm not going to get into the events of Holy Week, but we're going to look at three things this morning. Hopefully it'll come up in a second, maybe. There we go. We're going to look at three things this morning. Firstly, the way to the cross. Secondly, a bit of a bramble this second point. The gambler's hidden meaning mixed with a son's love. And then thirdly, the triumphant call. But before we go any further, let's read the Word of God together. Uh, I think it might come up on the screen, it might not. I'm reading from the ESV, and we're going to join chapter 19. We're going to read from verses 16 through to 30. And if you were here last week, it's a considerably shorter reading than it was last week. So, John 19 from verse 16 through to 30, and I'm reading from the ESV. There you go, it's on the screen. So he delivered him over. To, he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took him and he went out bearing his own cross to a place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. In Aramaic, of course, is a dialect of Hebrew. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, King of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge on it. They put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch, and held it to his mouth. When he had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord, and may the Lord bless it to us this morning. So, to our first point this morning, the way to the cross. Now, this might seem a silly question, but what is crucifixion? What is the crucifixion? Quite simply, it was the cruelest device ever invented. But it wasn't a Roman invention. They just merely perfected it. The Romans were good at killing people. The Persians were first to use it. They passed it on to the Carthaginians, who then, in turn, taught the Romans. Cicero, the Roman statesman, scholar, lawyer and writer, described it as the most cruel and horrifying death. Tacitus the Roman senator, historian, and no lover of Christians was no less scathing of it. He called it a despicable death. Most Romans shuddered at the thought 
of it. Indeed, no Roman citizen, no matter how bad the crime, who was to be executed, would be executed by crucifixion. That's how bad they thought it was. It was okay for anybody else to be crucified, but no Roman citizen would ever be crucified. Such was the despicability, if there is such a word, of the cross. Now, I'm not going to get into the detail, because it's actually quite horrible. Suffice to say, it could take die, it could take days to die of asphyxiation. Let me remind you of verse 16 for a moment, please. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. This is the no point. This is the point of no return for Jesus. It's at which this point he would have heard the Latin phrase, Ibis ad crucem. You will go to the cross. You will go to the cross. All of those who were judged and condemned to death by crucifixion would have heard those words. Sentence carried out immediately. There is absolutely no chance of saying goodbye to your loved ones. No chance of putting your affairs in order. It's done there and then. No niceties about it. No due process of a, maybe a second trial to get you off. It's there and then. Jesus is handed over to four Roman soldiers. They would be his executioners. But first, although there's no mention of it here, but you'll find it in Matthew 27, there is the scourging. There is the scourging. Beaten and whipped, and with every lash they would cleave skin. It's a horrible thought. The most horrific thing I have ever seen on film was the six and a half minutes depiction in Mel Gibson's A Passion of the scourging. It was horrific. No wonder the film was in 18. It's the most horrific thing I have ever seen and ever want to see. I've never watched it again. I don't ever want to watch it again. But it gave you a picture of what the Romans did to someone before they were crucified. Not only did they scourge them, they humiliated them as well. They put a crown of thorns on his head. Now, this wasn't the side. These weren't the wee thorns that you get in your rose bushes in your front garden. Oh no, these were big thorns. You're talking quarter inch, half inch thorns. Forced into his head. Forced into his head to make sure that he bled and he hurt. And then they put a purple robe on him. A robe of royal colour. Now why did they do that? Quite simply, it was an act of vengeance. It was an act of vengeance by Pilate. He had declared Jesus king of the Jews. Why was that an act of vengeance? Well, we'll come back to that later on, and we'll discuss that later on. The condemned also had to carry their own cross. The cross beam would be placed across Jesus' shoulders and tied to him. Can you imagine the pain and suffering that you're already going through and the humiliation, being lashed and beaten, and now you have to carry the very device that is going to kill you. You become complicit in your own execution. Can you imagine that? Can you figure that out in your head? And as they walk to the place of execution, being the Romans, it's not a direct walk. No, 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 no. It's not a direct walk. They take the long way through Jerusalem. The Romans did this for two reasons. The first reason was to make sure you knew. You might be living in a, a time of Pax Romana, the Roman peace, peace, but you bake the Roman peace, you'll suffer the Roman consequences. You'll know what Roman justice is. You have been warned. That's why they did that. That's the first reason why they did it. The second reason, remember what I said to you after being beaten and humiliated, they did it as an act of mercy. <laughs> really? An act of mercy? You're just about to be crucified. You have to carry your, own crucifi carry your own cross, your own execution device. You've been humiliated. This is an act of mercy. Well, thanks very much. Well, actually, it was an act of mercy. Because this was the last opportunity when you're marched through the streets of Jerusalem that someone can stand forward and say, I've got new evidence. He's innocent. You need to stop this. So in a sense, you did get the chance of a second trial. Although you wouldn't think so once you were condemned at that point. So it was an act of mercy. One, to make sure you were warned. And the second, 
the opportunity for somebody to stand up and say, this has to stop. This isn't right. As Christ walked through the streets of Jerusalem, there was a Roman soldier with a placard exclaiming what the condemned was to die for. Now, this placard carried before Jesus was no ordinary placard. The placard exclaimed who Jesus really is. But as I said earlier, this was done as an act of vengeance by Pilate towards the Jewish leaders who shouted for the death of Jesus. And what did the placard say? The placard said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Pilate knew he had been goaded into condemning Jesus. Let me read to you verse 12 of chapter 19. From that moment, from then, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Those words would have horrified. Would have horrified uh, your man. Pilate would have been scared into that. Because if it got back to Caesar that he'd allow a man to, another man to call himself king, they were literally saying to Pilate, you don't condemn him, you're committing treason. That's what they're saying. Pilate made sure, though, he had the last word. Pilate made sure he had the last word in all of this. You see, his vengeance made sure that the Jews in Jerusalem knew exactly who they had condemned, who they wanted to put to death. Now, the placard was written in three languages, Greek, Latin, and Aramaic. The Greeks taught the world beauty of form and thought. The Romans taught law and good government. And the Hebrews taught religion and worship of the true God. And Jesus is in all three of them. He's in all three of them. There is supreme beauty and the highest thought. Who's the highest personality in philosophy? I'm told it's Jesus. In him was the law and the kingdom of God, and also in him is the very image of God. So it's significant. No, it's not significant. It's highly significant and very symbolic that these three great languages call him king. Not just king of the Jews, but the universal king. The king of all mankind. That's what we're getting here in these three languages. Now to call him king, remember the picture I painted for you only a few moments ago. Of a man beaten, whipped, humiliated, carrying his own execution device. So to call him king at that point, just by looking at Jesus, would seem quite an absurd thing to do. There is no splendor or grandeur about him that we'd expect to see. Remember, this is the son of a carpenter. This was a carpenter himself. Carpenters don't become king. They wear quite poor clothing. They don't look like a king. They don't talk like a king. Maybe they don't smell like a king. I don't know. But one thing for sure, there's certainly not to look at Jesus, there's no splendor or grandeur. There's nothing kingly looking about him. But we need to acknowledge his kingship here. We must acknowledge his kingship here. As Bruce Millen in his commentary says, there are times we are called to believe, not because of, but in spite of. The Jewish leaders as you can imagine, we're very upset about the placard. And what it said, it, they were really upset about what it said, but at least one of their own that we know of at this point understood exactly the who and the what of Jesus. What was, a remi- what was on the placard was also a reminder of how easily they dropped God. Let me read verse 15 to you. They cried out, away with him, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. And John, let me take you back into John. In John chapter 3, we see Nicodemus come to Jesus and admit and say that we know, we know. They admit he's from God. They actually admitted the Jew, the people, the Jewish leaders in the background admitted they knew he was from God. 
So by default, they reject Jesus. They reject who? They reject God. Oh, how easily they dropped him. Oh, how easily they decided to put God to the side. Now, that was the way to the cross. Maybe not the way you expected. But John is painting a picture for us of just how matter of fact many in Jerusalem were taken with the who and the what of Jesus. John has given us a picture of how little those in Jerusalem realize the trouble they're in. But it's not just in Jerusalem. It's here and now. People don't realize the trouble they're in. Not just 2,000 years ago. It may seem I'm being a little matter of fact or maybe a little bit depressing, but let me assure you, things are going to change. As we move on, we're now going to look at the gambler's hidden meaning mixed with a son's love. You're probably thinking, okay, where's he going with this one? In these five verses, there are some stunning things going on here. Some stunning things going on. I'm going to look at a few of them. In verses 23 to 24, we see the gamblers at the foot of the cross. There are four of them. These four gamblers are the same four soldiers that were handed over to Jesus. These are his executioners. And they've done their job because he's on the cross. They were perks that came along with executing someone, with crucifying someone, and that is that you got to keep their clothes. Through the study for today, I discovered uh, that Jewish men wore five pieces of clothing. Shoes, turban, girdle, inner tunic, and outer robe. No, it wasn't a very good skill, but an 05 doesn't get any four. Four soldiers, so they all get one piece each, and they're left with one piece, the inner tunic, which is one piece without seam, woven from a piece of cloth. And that's what they're gambling for. Verse 24, let me remind you of verse 24. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. And this was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. That's verse 24. But that's not the first time, if you've read a Bible, you've seen that or heard that said. Go back a thousand years into the book of Psalms, go into Psalm 22, and that's where you'll find that prophecy. It was said a thousand years before by Jesus' own ancestor, David, King David. There's also a hidden meaning here with the garment that's being gambled. What well, Bartley tells us is in his commentary that it's the exact description of the tunic that's wore by the high priest. Now, what's the function of the high priest? Well, he was to be the liaison between God and his people. The Latin word for priest is the word pontifex, which means bridge builder. Jesus is that bridge between man and God. John wasn't just describing the clothes that Jesus wore. He's also telling us who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing for us. That's what he's telling us. There's a ton of stuff going on here. We've seen the gambling of four soldiers. And there's also their complete indifference as to what's going on round about them. That took me to Lamentations 12. Uh, Lamentations 1 verse uh, verse 12. Is it nothing to you, all who pass by? Look and see. They're not bothered that they've seen this commotion. They knew about the commotion of Jesus. They would be there, seeing it all happening, or how the Jews were wanting his death, how they did everything, and they, they, maybe they even knew he was innocent. But yet there they are, in a wee huddle, underneath the cross, at the bottom of the cross, throwing dice, or however it was they gambled for his clothing. And no bother to shut about it. So what else is here? We see Jesus in the midst of a harrowing execution, which is not known to be quick. It's death by torture in many ways. 
But this death made even worse, if it could get worse. It's more harrowing for Jesus because he's got something else. He's got the weight of the whole of mankind's, mankind's sin on his shoulders. He's not just bearing his own weight on the cross. He's bearing the, the weight of our sin on the cross as well. He's become the atonement for man's sin. It's bad enough being nailed to it, but to carry us with him as well. In the midst of all this pain and suffering, there is the absolute love and devotion of a son towards his mother. His mother Mary is there watching and no doubt in torment at her son's suffering. No mother should have to watch their child die. No mother. She's there with others, as we read. But also there is the apostle John, the apostle that Jesus loved, the disciple that Jesus loved. Now by being there, they have put themselves in a huge amount of danger. They're telling everyone by their presence, they're with Jesus. Now that association alone can put you in a bad place with the Romans. Just because they knew somebody, oh, you must be as bad as him, won't be me, son. They've put themselves in a very, very dangerous place. You see, Mary has no interest in her own safety. None at all. Any fear she has is driven away by the love of a mother that knows no bounds. The true love of a mother is also on display at the cross. Not just the love of a son, but the love of a mother. Through all of this pain and anguish that Jesus is going through, he sees his mother and his thoughts are simply that he needs to look after his mum and her future well-being. In the midst of this huge battle of good and evil, as Willie Bartley describes it, this cosmic battle, Jesus did not forget his duties as a son. Right up to the very last, he was living out the Ten Commandments. Commandment 5, honour thy father and thy mother. That's what he was doing. That was his thought at that moment was for his mum and how she going to be looked after. There's no welfare state here. He knows he's the eldest son. And Jesus wanted to make sure his mother was safe. How did he do that? Verses 26 and 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So why John? Well, Jesus is making sure his mother was looked after by family. Because Jesus and John are cousins. He wanted to make sure the family looked after his mum. Right to the end, his thoughts are towards others and not of himself. All too often I catch myself in that famous Terry Wogan phrase, me, 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 me. For some of us that are old enough to have listened to Terry Wogan on Radio 2 every morning. But no, Jesus. You would forgive him if he was thinking that or said that, wouldn't you? You would forgive him for what he's going through. No. His mother, and us too, and us too, came before consideration of his own condition, of his own pain and suffering. We came before himself. In these verses, we see Jesus' kingship come out again. Cosmic decisions are being made about mankind here. Yet, here, the individual is not forgotten. How do we know this? Let me take you further into the New Testament, into Hebrews 13 and 5. But it was said, what, what's in Hebrews 13 and 5? was said long before it was said in Hebrews. We go all the way back to six or seven book of the Bible into the book of Joshua. Joshua 1 and verse 5. 
And what does it say? Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. That wasn't written in the plural. That was written in the singular. It was for you. It was for you. It was for you. It was for you. It wasn't, for, it wasn't said in a plurality. It was said singular. It was for you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That's how we know. There's so much going on in these verses. So much. But they are nothing. Nothing compared to our last three verses. The triumphant call. The triumphant call. Here is where the atonement happens. Now, for many out in the world, the perspective of the crucifixion is one of defeat. But its ultimate perspective is one of victory. It is one of victory. Earlier we saw differing aspects of Jesus' kingship. Hidden, universal, and personal. To quote Bruce Milne once again, As Jesus is lifted upon the cross, he's elevated. His cross his throne. This is Christ. This is Jesus' coronation. The ultimate in kingship when you're crowned king. This is his coronation. This is the perspective of the cross. This is the victorious perspective. And this is the confirmation of what Pilate said in John 19 verse 14. Behold your king. Well, not only about to hear a triumphant call, but we're also about to see a triumphant end. John, in these last three verses, brings out two aspects here. The first is human suffering. It shows that Jesus is truly human. He's truly God. He's also truly human. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, Jesus is offered a drink mixed with myrrh. Myrrh was used as a sedative to stop pain. But Jesus knew that to to take this, to do this, would stop him feeling the pain of humanity. It would stop him feeling the pain of our sin. He would desensitize himself from mankind. And John is emphasizing here that Jesus is not not only fully man, but he's also fully God. The great reformer, Some would say the man that started the Reformation, Martin Luther, said this. As long as man does not know Christ, he does not know the true God, the God hidden in sufferings. It's only through Christ's sufferings do we know God. None of us would be here this morning if it wasn't for Christ and the cross suffering. Fact. This is the servant king before us. He took the pain of our sin and with himself nailed it to the cross. He came not to be served, but to serve. And he did this by his sufferings on the cross. Another aspect that John brings out is the absolute triumph of Jesus. In verse 30, Jesus says, it's finished. This is not as Don Carson, his commentary says, Uh, he rightly points out it's not a cry of defeat or of imminent death this is a shout by God's son of a task to be carried out but not only carried out accomplished it was actually accomplished Matthew 27 and 50 Jesus cried out in a loud voice and here in verse 30 it is finished now in the Greek the word for this is tetelestai which means shout of triumph Jesus' last words on the cross were of triumph, not surrender. As we said earlier, this is Christ's coronation. This is a shout of triumph. This is a show of victory here. When he did this, when he said, this is how much I love you, this is the shout of triumph. This is the victory stance that he took. Now what happened at that moment he died? Well, Matthew's gospel tells us that the temple curtain was rent or torn from top to bottom. This was the curtain in the temple that separated man from God. That separated man from God. Only the high priest could go beyond the temple, but once a year, to atone for the sins of the Jewish nation. Now that curtain's gone. 
There is no longer any restriction between man and God. Christ's atoning sacrifice has opened up a clear way to God. No more do we need a go-between. Christ is now the pontifex. He is the bridge for us. We don't need a priest anymore. His sacrifice made that bridge for us. A bridge that leads to a new way, a new start. The opportunity for you to lay all your burdens, but more importantly, the sin at the feet of Jesus. Two things that have to happen, you have to do for that to happen. First, you have to admit that Christ is Lord and Saviour. You have to. But there's something else that comes before that. And it's a hard thing to do. It's a difficult thing to do. It's a horrible word that you have to admit that you have. Three-letter word. The world hates it. That's the word sin. You have to admit there is sin in your lives. I stand here before you as one. A sinner. I'm not making myself out to be better than anyone else. I'm not. I'm a sinner. But I dropped it like many people in this room at the foot of the cross. Christ gave me that new start, that new beginning. So as I finish, let me ask you one more question. Will you walk over that bridge this morning? Will you walk over that bridge this morning? Amen. Colin and the team are going to come back up and they're going to lead us in one final hymn this morning. We'll stand to sing and could you please remain standing the final benediction at the end. Thank you.